Okay. The following interview was conducted with, with Pre Professor Don K. Gentry, Special Assistant to the Provost and Professor of Industrial Technology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, November 24, 2008 in Stewart Center Television Studio. Welcome. Good afternoon to you. Thank you. Okay, tell us a little bit about your, where you were born and your fam parents and early years and well, high school. I'm, I'm a native Hoosier, uh, born and raised in Montgomery County. In a, Lived in a small town of Browns Valley. You have to pass through there in order to know where it is. Uh, in between the shades, Turkey Run State Park. Went to high school at Waveland. What was uh, grade school like? What was uh, small? Well, it was also Waveland. Okay. And, so, and uh, went all 12 years in at Waveland. Um, I tell people I was salutatorian in my class. Uh, of course, there was only 13 in the graduating class, a very small class. Uh, which gave me interesting opportunities then when I came to Purdue because they didn't offer chemistry, physics, or only two years of math in my high school. So I had a lot of catching up to do when I came to Purdue. Yeah, How did you happen to select Purdue? Well, it was an interesting thing. My dad didn't graduate from high school. He, he dropped out of school at the seventh grade uh, during the Depressions to help my grandfather save the family farm. And I'll never, you know, I can never remember my dad ever saying anything about when you go to college. It's when, it's when you go to college, you're going to Purdue. It wasn't if you're going to college, it's when you're going to college. He said that both to me and my brother, I have an older brother, and we both came to Purdue. And coming from an agricultural background, we both studied agriculture. And um, what, did you, what year did you enter Purdue? Uh, in the spring of eight, uh, 58. Okay. Um, graduated high school in 57, went into the uh, Army Reserve uh, for some active duty. Uh, was supposed to go there for six months. After four months, the commanding officer of the unit uh, came along, and this, of course, was between the Korean Vietnam and Vietnam Wars. Uh, the commanding officer came around and said that anyone that had enrolled in college could be let out early enough to go back to the spring semester. And so, I had my records from Purdue, and I got those from home and presented those, and, and so I only served four months active duty because they really didn't want anybody in the, in the service. I came to Purdue then in the spring of 58, uh, studied animal science. Later on, did a double major in animal science and agriculture education, and then uh, went back to Montgomery County and taught in uh, what is now North Montgomery Schools in Coal Creek Central at the time vocational agriculture uh, for five years. Tell us, let's go back into college. Tell us a little about your experiences in college, your uh, pressures well, and campus. I, I was, uh, I lived at Rochdale Co-op, uh, which uh, is no longer on campus, but it was. Uh, Where was that? Where was it located? It was on Waldron Street. Okay. Uh, right next to the, right down the street uh, from the black and gold or the B&G restaurant that's no longer there. That's where the computer Caddy science corner from the armory, right? Yeah, there's a uh, cross from the armory and uh, where a parking garage is now. There you go. And uh, lived there uh, my total time at Purdue. Uh, very active in student activities, particularly in the School of Agriculture. Was president of the Purdue Student uh, Agriculture Student Council. Uh, uh, what's called, uh, I don't know what they call it today, but the Block and Bridal Club at that time, which was the Animal Science Club, uh, a couple of honoraries, and so very active in, in the house and in Purdue activities. Uh, did not uh, play sports, but went to everything that I could go to, and sports uh, interesting. At the time, uh, all students got free tickets to the basketball and football games. Uh, that's no longer true at Purdue, but uh, <laughs> but as a as a freshman and sophomore, you got selected tickets to the basketball games because they didn't have enough room uh, at that time. And because uh, it was in the field house, in the Lambert Field House, and uh, freshmen got tickets uh, for a few games, and we sat way up at the top. And so, uh, uh, great experience coming back to Purdue. And uh, then, uh, what was the campus like? It wasn't as large as it is now. No, I was trying to think, hey, you could go back in history books and see sure. what the enrollment was, but uh, mostly males. Uh, of course, in the late 50s, early 60s, we had a number of uh, vets that was returning and uh, 
So we had a lot of older students in our classes, which made a lot of the classes very serious classes because uh, they were here on the GI Bill and, and they had that opportunity. And so uh, uh, pretty serious place. It was prior to the, you know, I graduated in 62, prior to the times of the late 60s and 70s when the campus the wasn't the other uh, generation <laughs> came in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you meet your, did you, uh, what family, did you meet your wife here? I, I met my wife here. Uh, she's actually from the Lafayette area. Uh, I met her uh, uh, in the summertime. I had a uh, summer job being a 4-H leader in Tippecanoe County in two townships, and I met her through the 4-H program uh, here, and uh, we dated through through college and, and was married uh, I probably shouldn't say it for history, but uh, I went to work for a trustee of a school system in in Coal Creek Township in Montgomery County, and uh, he had fired the teacher that I was replacing, and he asked me after I was there about uh, two weeks uh, if I was married, which is something you no employer would ask today, and I said no, but we have plans next year, and he said, well, I think we ought to do it this summer. Now, that was in June, and we got married in July before school started then in August. And so uh, it was, we tell people we had to get married. That was the, <laughs> uh, but uh, no, we've been married uh, 46 years and, and uh, have three children, uh, all three Purdue graduates, uh, two of them married to Purdue graduates, and so we have Ten Purdue degrees in our family. So, uh, <laughs> Little mini, mini alumni. We're just uh, black and gold. Yeah, there you go. Well, go on, then after you finished. Uh, well, then after I finished uh, Purdue, I, I, I started teaching. Mm -hmm. I taught five years in Cold Creek Central in vocational agriculture. Uh, had some successes there and, and was selected to be a state supervisor of vocational agriculture for the State Department of Education. Uh, we, Where did that we moved in, it was in Indianapolis, okay. and, and we moved from uh, New Richmond, uh, which is where the movie Hoosiers was filmed. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I interviewed for my job in high school sitting in the barber chair that's in the movie Hoosiers. That's always interesting, the tidbit. We moved then to Zionsville. I worked in Indianapolis uh, 16, 17 years. Uh, after I was working in the State Department for uh, about two years, uh, they asked me, uh, selected me to be the state director of vocational technical education. What did that entail? Well, that was the, uh, the kind of the state governing board for all high school and two-year technical uh, college programs uh, in the state. Uh, Ivy Tech was just getting started, and so uh, I worked during the earlier years of uh, primarily uh, being the state regulatory and then the biggest responsibility was distributing uh, at that time large sums of money, about twenty million dollars worth of federal funds that came into the state for uh, vocational technical education. We built uh, a lot of the area of vocational career centers that are still in operation around the state during that time and then uh, worked with the Ivy Tech system as they got started which eventually became thirteen regional kinds of campuses sure. and then grew was there an, uh, was there a need for that is that why this building and expansion of the program well I think there was a there was a great need because you know a lot of kids went to college but there was a a number of students that didn't want to go to a four-year college and so the the need for skill training both in high school and in the Ivy Tech system was great then still is very important in this yeah. state and other states Indiana was kind of behind the the trend in the community college technical college right. system and it really didn't exist person. it didn't exist and we're catching up now so right. yeah. so I was in on some of the earlier years of that mm -hmm. and uh, uh, great experiences there uh, worked for three different governors during that period of time of different parties uh, which I always like to tell people that uh, I have Sagamore of the Wabash from both parties, and so they could never determine what uh, political party I had. <laughs> that helps a little bit. It helped a little it bit. It balances it. Yes. All right. Then what, what came next? What, well, after did, that, uh, I had... When you talk about the state, the state tech, why... Uh, state well, I came, I came to Purdue uh, uh, 
during the time that John Hicks, uh, who had been a long-term mentor of mine, in fact, I'd had uh, Dr. Hicks as a freshman in Ag Econ class, as a teacher, wonderful teacher, uh, got to know him as he got to know all of his students. Then the sophomore year, he had moved to the president's office as a special assistant to the president. That still was taught President Hovde, correct? President Hovde. Uh, he still taught uh, economics, uh, the famous 210 course, and I had him again in that. And then as I worked in Indianapolis, of course, John was uh, the lobbyist for Purdue, and uh, he came to my office frequently as we worked with uh, Purdue on some associate degree programs and and I worked with the legislature for my programs and got to know him and he came to my office in uh, early 1983 and said that uh, Purdue had this program that they'd gotten approved to start statewide technology and I asked him uh, uh, what it was all about he said it was to expand the opportunities for people to have two and four year technology degrees from Purdue around the state of Indiana by building partnerships with other institutions. And he said they were looking for a person to head that up and he had appointed a search committee and he outlined the requirements of the job and I thought Dr. Hicks was asking me for a recommendation for somebody that, and I said, well, let me think about it. You know, there's not a lot of people who have had all of those experiences you've outlined. He said, yes, I'm talking to him. So um, he said, uh, I asked him if I was in trouble in my state job, and he said no, but now would be a good time to leave when you're on top. And so uh, he, he kind of offered me the position. I said, there's two conditions. Uh, it's kind of a surprise. First, I need to talk to my wife about this before I make a job change. And he said, well, he would expect that. And I said, and at that time, about two months earlier, they had named Dr. Beering as the president of Purdue. So it was kind of the end of the year that Dr. Hicks was the interim president. I said, I would like to meet with your new president to see what his attitude is towards this program. And of course, John Hicks was always organized. He said, he's waiting for us over at his office at the medical school. So we walked from my office about three blocks over to see Dr. Beering. And I didn't realize at the time, but he had started the statewide medical education program for Indiana University when he was dean there. And so I quickly knew that he knew exactly about what we were all about with the statewide technology program. So I came to Purdue in 1983 in the fall and started a program that ended up being 12 locations around the state where primarily we built relationships with Indiana University and Anderson College and some other places where our students would take the general education requirements from those institutions and the School of Technology, now the College of Technology, would offer the uh, technical programs so that people that were working or didn't have the opportunity to go to a four-year institution uh, because they, of the family situation and so forth could uh, get a two- or four-year degree, right. uh, become a very successful program, still is a very successful program around the state. Some of my greatest memories of Purdue uh, comes out of that experience. Uh, how did how did you select the sites? I mean, how did you work out some of those? That might be helpful to the researchers. Well, it was it was primarily uh, at that time Indiana and Purdue University kind of had the state covered with regional campuses. Right. And we already with IU, of course, more than yeah, IU more than Purdue, sure. but Purdue already had programs in Fort Wayne and Indianapolis and up in Calumet area. So we knew that those areas were pretty much covered. So we kind of took the the population regions of the state. We went to South Bend, later to Elkhart, off mm -hmm. from South Bend. We went to Columbus and we went to, to Richmond, uh, Anderson, Indiana, down to New Albany. Uh, we didn't do much on the western side uh, south of Purdue because Indiana State University had some programs much like what we were doing. Of course, Vincennes University was further on down and uh, we, uh, and then uh, Indiana State University had started building a, a kind of a regional campus which later became University of Southern Indiana mm -hmm. at Evansville. Right. So we were in New Albany and, and, right. and those kinds of places. Partnering with Indiana University's regional campuses primarily, except in Anderson, with Anderson University and Elkhart, we actually uh, occupied uh, programs in the Career Center and 
Indiana University brought the general education right. programs. What, you, what about teachers, your faculty? How did you? Well, the, the did faculty. They come from here? The, uh, oh. Some of them oh. come from here, but we primarily hired new faculty members to, to do that. Uh, they were on the faculty here, uh, related to the faculty here, served on committees so that we could keep the curriculum sure. uh, pure and those types of things. Uh, grew into a very successful program. Right. One of my greatest memories, though, of uh, one of the things you said you were going to ask about yeah. was that uh, we, I probably, uh, I think I have maybe the record of going to the most commencements of anybody in the history of Purdue so far. I uh, counted up. I've gone to 162 commencements because well, we did. A good record. We, we went to uh, all the statewide technology sites. We'd go to the Indiana University campuses and we'd give the Purdue degrees at this, at their commencements, uh, and we do that every year. Plus, going to all the commencements here on campus as, as either associate or, or as a dean. We had a small program down at Versailles, Indiana, at the uh, Career Center there. And the second or third year we had the program, we had uh, our first graduate in statewide technology. Uh, one, uh, one lady, uh, she was about 40 years old, and she'd been working, taking extension courses and transferred some courses in, and so she had an associate degree she'd earned. I said to Dr. Bearing, do we want to do a commencement for one student? He says one student is extremely important, so we take our robes and the whole per Everything that you do in a commencement, they got a piano player to play the, the pomp and circumstance, and we, we, we marched in. We had this commencement for one student. And uh, I thought we had a record and came back and said something to Joe Bennett at the time, and he said, well, we've gone to the history books. I think the first graduation at Purdue on the main campus only had one graduate. I said, well, we, we tied the record. <laughs> that was a male. I'm almost sure. I'm was sure it was a male. Right. We had a female. <laughs> right, yeah. But uh, the inter interesting thing about that experience, there were 70-some people at commencement, not all her family. Uh, the community was so appreciative of Purdue University bringing the program there that they made an announcement in the newspaper, and people come to commencement that didn't even know the, the lady that they was They didn't graduate. know what it was, right, yeah. yeah. But it was just to support the program. Right. You mentioned earlier about the career centers. You sort of tied it in with that, sort of helped with the, mm -hmm. with the instruction curriculum and then the career close well, by. It was, Two, two reasons, they had the facilities and they had some laboratories that we could use for double reasons. One for the higher education programs and they would use them because we were primarily offering evening classes to, uh, you know, for the adults uh, that were working during the day. Right. So uh, the career centers used the facilities in the daytime, we used them at night, sure. made good use of them. Right. And we, we did that in two or three locations. Right. So. Were the students y uh, younger, older? Or with, uh, no, the yeah. average age was probably 35. Okay. Uh, again, mostly male because of the nature of the programs we were offering was engineering technology types of things. Uh, later on, we started getting more females when we started offering the information technology programs. But we were, uh, and it's true today in the College of Technology that they have more males than females because of the nature of the programs. Sure, right. okay. Now let's move into the college. You were the assistant dean for a while. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that. And then well, I was director of statewide technology and then a year later uh, the dean said, well, you should have an assistant dean title. I served one year as assistant dean and director of statewide technology. Uh, then a year later the uh, Dr. Sams, who was the, uh, Denver Sams, was the associate dean long time in the in the College of Technology. Yeah, I recognize his name. Uh, retired, and uh, George McNally was the dean, and Dr. McNally came to my office and he said, I'd like to make you associate dean. And I said, does that mean we hire somebody for statewide technology? And he said, no, I think you can do that too. So then I had about three jobs, you know. <laughs> One of the things that you learn in administration is never take along all the past jobs with you when you move up. But uh, I was only associate dean uh, then for a year. Uh, about halfway through that year, uh, Dr. McNally came into my office and said uh, he was thinking about retiring, and he talked to Dr. Beering about uh, retiring and thought I'll apply for the dean's job. And I said, well, uh, that's interesting. But, you know, I didn't come up through the faculty ranks like everybody else. I came in kind of from the outside, and he said, well, uh, we've got a faculty search and screen committee. They're going to look at it. And so I said, well, 
let's leave it this way. If they want to consider me, well, then uh, I'll talk to them. So one day I got a call, and, and they called me over for an interview, and I interviewed. And about a week or two later, I got a call from Dr. Beering. He wanted me to come over to his office, and when could I come over? Well, one of the things you learn is if the president calls you, go now, you know. So I said, well, I guess I'm available right now. So I went over, and he said, uh, that search committee over there for the dean's job didn't do what I told him to do. He said, I asked him to bring me two qualified candidates. He said, I guess they thought maybe I'd make a mistake. They only brought me one, and that was you. So uh, he asked me to be dean and a um, delightful person to work with. Uh, I would like to relate some point in the interview that I've had the opportunity to know and work with the last five presidents of Purdue, That's starting right. with Dr. Hovde and up through Dr. Cordova. Right. Uh, all different people. and. But it was a, it was a delightful experience to, to work with. Of course, with. you had met him first off when he was still, before he came here. That's right. We were talking about the statewide program. Yeah. He had been appointed but hadn't started. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bering was a delightful person to work with, uh, very concerned about you personally and your family, and I right. think that was the, the doctor that came out at him. I think so. But a, a wonderful person, both yeah. he, he and Jane, uh, wonderful Very people. warm and outgoing. Yeah. It was nice that they were there at the thing on Saturday yes. for Joe Tiller. I thought yes. that was really nice. Well, um, now as a dean, tell us a little bit about some of the Well, the, the, the dean, uh, you know, timing is... Dr. though, stayed on, am I correct? Pardon? He just retired, he just stepped down from yeah, that, he, he was still Yeah, he, he totally retired. Oh, okay. Uh, and, uh, of course, he was a... Uh, Charles Lawshey had been the organizing dean of the, of the school. He served one year, and then George McNally had served, I think, 21 years. So I was the third dean in the history of the school, and I served 13 or 14 years as dean. Uh, timing is everything. Uh, the opportunity to be dean was at the right time. Uh, we had just a couple years ahead. Of, before that, moved into Kanoi Hall. We had new facilities. Uh, the growth of the program, I think we went from 2,000 students to 4,000 students during the, my tenure. We created a lot of new laboratories. Uh, uh, created a fundraising program. The first year I was dean, we raised $100,000. The last year I was dean, I think we raised $8 million. And so, wow. uh, How did that come about? How, well, you know, more, more of an alumni base, do you think? Uh, primarily, our, our largest contributions, and I think still true today in the college, uh, comes from corporations. Uh, they're very supportive of the kinds of graduates that came out of that school. And so we got a lot of uh, equipment donations and scholarship donations and support that way from corporations and a lot of individuals. Our alumni base, uh, of course, wasn't, uh, we didn't have a lot of older alumni right. because we were a fairly new school. Uh, and so uh, alumni base, uh, some of them have been strong supporters like uh, Mr. Weiss, uh, Nysong, who has built a building for us. and started building a second building for us, was a graduate in the aviation program. But mostly it's been corporations mm -hmm, over the years. Mm -hmm. I think as the alumni base grows in the College of Technology, mm -hmm. that will be more prevalent. That's I'm right. sure it's true today. Did you put in any new programs that uh, when you were Well, there? the thing that we, one of the things we instituted was the uh, manufacturing program. Uh, we had a lot of components of the manufacturing programs. When we opened Kanoi Hall, we had uh, uh, a space that wasn't designated, which is unusual in any new building around Purdue. We made that into the Manufacturing Technology Laboratory, which became uh, quite a show place because we had, that's where we had all the robotics and the, the Is that conveyor. where President Reagan? That's yeah. where President Reagan. And that Left his footprints, his hands. That was one of the, that was one of the most delightful things uh, during my. Tell us a little bit, make a couple comments on that. Please. Well. Uh, I think he came in 87, I believe. 87, right. uh, just a couple months. I was associate dean at the time. George McNally was still dean. Yeah. Uh, we spent about 20 days working with the White House staff and the communications staff uh, getting ready for that visit. He was going to visit the College of Engineering's uh, research lab and then visit this manufacturing lab because he was going to give a presentation on the importance of technology in the workforce today. Did that up at uh, Mackey Arena. Right. Um, we prepared this laboratory. Uh, the night before, we had everything set, 
uh, one of the White House staff members came in and there was 30 computers around that laboratory that each one operated a different machine or was a different purpose. And he said, uh, you have a lot of the same programs running on those computers. And I said, well, this is a teaching laboratory. He said, I think for the pictures, we'd like to have something different on each screen. Well, today that would be very easy, but we had two technicians that worked all night getting different things to work on those screens. <laughs> and wouldn't you know, the table that we set for the discussion with Dr. Buring and, and Dr. McNally, and myself, and uh, Fred Emshausen, who was the head of the program, the computer right behind President Reagan was the one that went out during the interview. All the rest of them worked. And so of course. But they brought him in. Um, a lot of interesting things. Of course, everybody wanted to see him. Everybody wanted to hear the speech. Uh, the White House communications people, the Secret Service people, didn't want him to cross the airport, uh, uh, the railroad tracks from the airport. So they blocked off the railroad tracks about a mile each direction so that no train could accidentally come down that track. Um, they found out that we had a tunnel system on campus. He couldn't cross over any tunnel in his car. So we had to find a route that he could get to Kanawha Hall and, and Michael Golden Laboratories without crossing in the tunnels. And so uh, he came with a, a suit of armor on out of the car we had to have a room that we could take him to that they could take that off. And then one of my requirements was I was supposed to have uh, two bottles of water for him in this holding room. And we would cleared all of that with the Secret Service people. And so uh, when he landed at the airport, we had television on to see him land. And the students and the faculty were all set in the laboratory. So I went down the hallway to the refrigerator to get the two bottles of water to put them in the room where Dr. Beering was going to meet President Reagan. And the Secret Service man stopped me and said I couldn't do that. So they, all of a sudden I had caused an incident. But they got on their little microphones and discovered that yes, that was part of the routine. I was supposed to do that. And he came at the laboratory, a uh, delightful grandfather type figure, talked to the students. This one young lady was running our uh, computer-assisted design station and was going to give him a demonstration, which the students actually built uh, a mock of, of a Republican symbol and put the gipper on it and carved it out through this uh, milling machine. And uh, he, he walked over to this station and this young lady was so nervous because this is the President of the United States. Put his hand on her shoulder and he said, now, let me assure you, I know nothing about this technology. You just show me everything about it. And she relaxed. And, and That was it. That was it. Right. Uh, the news media was there. Of course, there had been some Russian incident that day. They kept uh, yelling questions to him. And he finally said in his normal way, he, he said, I'm here to talk to these young people about technology, not to answer your questions about Russia. And he closed them down. So. <laughs> Uh, a delightful thing, uh, and then of course, all that preparation it lasted about 20 minutes in our in our building. Right. But it was, didn't you give him a robot? Didn't he get something at the? Yes, he got a he got a robot. Did, you, did that, the school do that? Well, that? the whole university oh, we participated they? in that. He actually got it up at the uh, at the uh, Mackey Arena. Mackey, yes, because I I was there. At uh, Mackey interesting Mackey. story of that was that it was a remote, remote con control robot, and the student was off in the audience controlling the robot and it would walk, talk, and lights would flicker and so forth. Well, they presented it to him and uh, he, he seemed to be taken by it. He, uh, one of his assistants wanted to carry it for him and no, he was going to carry it. So he carried it off the stage, uh, out the back of Mackey Arena, up the chute, and, uh, and by the time he got out of the range of the, ro of the, of the remote control, we couldn't control the robot. One of the most delightful things we've ever seen was the pictures then on the screen of him going up into Air Force One at the airport carrying this robot with his eyes still blinking and the <laughs> arms still moving. So we get a call from the Secret Service wanting to know where the remote control was. And so they 
police department took the remote control so they could shut the thing off. <laughs> and so, a lot of interesting. Uh, yeah, that was a silent. good thing, <laughs> right? Oh, uh, and, and you talked about a little bit about thunder and the students. The enrollment has increased. Yes, yeah. and right. I think it. Uh, we got to about four thousand students, and I think that's what they've tried to hold it to today. Uh, we, we about. Well, the f facility was built for 3,000 students. We had 4,000 in it, and so wow. we've about used up the facilities. Right. And that was kind of the the level of the of the mixture that the campus needed in order to right. meet our enrollment goals. Are you still giving an associate uh, degree <clears throat> in this Yes, well? they do, but not on this campus. Oh. Uh, I, I, very few students get the associate right. degree. Okay. Uh, most of them come here for a four-year degree. Right. Okay. Them. Now let's talk about engagement after that. Uh, the dean, well, uh, how did that come at about? the end of Dr. Bering's term, uh, of course, economic development became a big issue in the state of Indiana. Right. He asked me if I would uh, serve as assistant to the president for economic development while serving as dean. I did that for a year or two at the end of his term. Uh, kind of setting the stage for how Purdue would reach out. We were doing a lot of work through the technical assistance program, through engineering, through the Cooperative Extension Service and agriculture, but but not in the other areas. And so trying to set the stage with that. Uh, a year later, uh, uh, Dr. Jeske came on as president, and of course he brought with, us, with him uh, new terminology for the campus, the engagement, uh, uh, discovery, and, and learning. Uh, still the land-grant college mission, and but more active terms than learning, teaching, and research, or teaching, uh, research, and, and service. Um, and he started talking to me about this term engagement. And uh, after a few months, he said to me, you know, uh, I'd like for you to have one job instead of two, and we want to start this office of engagement uh, if you'd like to do that, then uh, I could be the first vice provost for engagement. And so uh, started the office of engagement, uh, trying to get uh, all the colleges and schools on campus to realize that, uh, to implement what they research, implement what they teach, to truly serve the state of Indiana, the communities, business community, governmental units. And uh, that's been a very active program ever since. I did that for four years. You did a lot of traveling. A lot of traveling. I've always done a lot of traveling in my sure. career, but uh, uh, that was primarily around the state of Indiana. Uh, we were one of the early universities that really uh, adopted the whole engagement theory of uh, not just cooperative extension service, but every college and uh, liberal arts, everybody had to do outreach and engagement. and. Uh, uh, and we were one of the first universities, I think, that took it from a university standpoint instead of putting it in a specific school. Mm -hmm. That raises a comment I was going to say. I'm going to ask you, you got the corporate extension, which had been yeah. Dean Lillian Grant, and then you got TAP, and then you have engagement. So mm -hmm. that, the, but engagement is broadening it. Engagement was broadening it, sure. and, and those two programs became very much uh, components of the engagement office. Uh, TAP. Uh, reports to the Vice Provost for Engagement. Right. Uh, the and that has grown. It has grown. They've doubled in the last three, three or four years in, right, exactly. in their scope. Including centers as well as funding <coughs> yes, and whatever. Yes. Yeah. And so it all fit together. The statewide technology program, the TAP program, cooperative extension service, uh, outreach that we had K through 12 through the College of Education. Uh, and so every school found a niche to, to reach out and help either public schools or local communities or government. Or, and uh, that's really uh, what the land-grant university was right. developed around and Purdue's done a very good job of that. Right. And this just broadened it a big way. Right. Because right. the right. cooperative extension was the first one that uh, goes right. way, way mm -hmm. back in time. Mm -hmm. um, so after that, what did you, you did that for several well, years? I, I had a birthday. I turned 65, and when you at Purdue, as the trustees rule that uh, you can't serve in a top-level administrative position after 65. Uh, so <clears throat> at the time, Dr. Jeske and Sally Mason was the provost. I said to them, "Well, I I should retire. Uh, I'll go back to the College of Technology." And and I had taught a couple of graduate classes along the way, and. Uh, Sally said no, she wanted me to stay 
uh, in the provost office and help with some special projects. And so I never went back to the College of Technology to teach, but uh, uh, took the voluntary early retirement program, the five-year program at Purdue, where I work half-time. Uh, this is my fifth year on that. Uh, uh, directed uh, two Lilly Endowment projects, one to build a learning center in Tip Tipton County, another much larger program to uh, uh, build uh, more internships, uh, what was called Indiana Interns, uh, uh, and also uh, expand the, uh, from the research uh, park, uh, the kinds of uh, education that people can get in uh, starting new companies to try to support right. that. Sure. And so we did that program, and then uh, about two years ago, uh, Dr. Jeske uh, got a letter from some potential investors in a university in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. I want to know if Purdue was interested in consulting with them on developing a new university. Uh, he asked me if I would head that up, and uh, I've done that the last two years of working with uh, in the Middle East uh, on a, uh, a project that uh, eventually we think will grow a new university there. Uh, whether Purdue's involved or somebody else, it'll be kind of a land-grant sure. mission program. I've traveled there five times in the last two years. It's been a delightful experience to, for a new culture. And, and it's a lot of seat time on an airplane. It's, uh, 12 hours one way from New York and 14 hours back from New York <laughs> to New York. But, uh, uh, that's been a good experience. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of in the, my last year of... of, of is this going to be your last year? Well, this is my fifth year. So if... Uh, I don't know. I'm not ready to retire. I'll, <laughs> no, I'll find something so. else to do. Uh, let's talk a little, just a couple of things on strategic plan and diversity. Mm -hmm. Make a couple of comments on that. Well, the... Uh, of course, the engagement fits... Fit right into that. When Dr. Jeske Dr. 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 was probably the first one that uh, had a very broad strategic plan involving a lot of people in the university, I had the opportunity to be one of the 26 people that served on his committee that developed that first plan. And we put together then uh, what the goals of the university would be. Engagement was a big part of that because we, it came at a time when we were just kind of forming the, Sure. the Office of Engagement, and so that was a new uh, trying to talk about how you take research out of the laboratories into the discovery mode to expand the research park. Uh, then uh, Discovery Park became a part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of buildings on campus happened as a result of that first plan. And then Dr. Cordova has continued that in her administration with a, mm -hmm. with a new plan. Uh, a big part of that strategic plan that got everybody involved was the major capital campaign to fund the needed resources that the state couldn't supply for all the strategic plan. Uh, of course, a part of that plan, as most universities, we've been concerned about to expand our diversity. Uh, I think Purdue's always done a very good job in that, but there's always more we can do. Um, we. I think our diversity as far as international students and the various cultures have always been very good. We, we have 130 different countries involved in this campaign. That goes way, way back. It goes there. way back. So that's People not a, forget about that. That's not a new thing. You, had their, you look in the debris, they're the clubs. Right. Uh, Philippines and China. Yeah. Well, and even today we're, we're in the top two or three that's in the right. numbers of international right. students. Uh, we don't quite yet serve the percentage of black students that the population of the state of Indiana and a lot of work's being done on that uh, and I think Dr. Cordova has uh, right. things in this plan that deals with those kinds of things uh, and so uh, that's been a it's been also an issue for administration to try to find faculty and staff that uh, right. uh, were sometimes at a disadvantage because people uh, diverse backgrounds uh, don't really always uh, associate with living in Lafayette or West Lafayette, Indiana. Right. And, yeah. But uh, I think the people that come here, uh, so many people at Purdue uh, come to Purdue for a year and 30 years later still here. I know that. <laughs> you and I know that. Oh, let's see. You're, well, we're not going to talk about post-retirement activities because you're still here. Um, mm -hmm. How about your uh, favorite Purdue tradition? 
And then I'll let you make some comments on your notes. Well, uh, I saw that question, and I don't know. There's a lot of them. I, you know. Well, you can I, have more than one. I, I enjoy all. A the, lot of people have more than one. The sporting uh, kinds of things. Uh, I've been involved with the the Glee Club as a as a sire. I think that one of the traditions of having such a wonderful Glee Club is is a tradition. Uh, one of the traditions that I miss is that uh, I think we're less formal today in a lot of things we do than we used to be. Uh, I'm, I think the commencements, though, are, are the, one of the traditions that we do it right, we do it well, we do it with a, a lot of uh, honor and, and color, and, and it's the right way to do commencements. I hope we never lose that. Um, That's been echoed by other people. I believe right. this is good. And, uh, uh, one of the traditions that we've lost, that which uh, I think that most administrations are glad that it's gone. Uh, during Dr. Beering's administration, uh, we all wore the, the gold jackets to every event, including football games, whether it was hot or cold. We wore s jackets and ties, and, and uh, mm -hmm. my wife always says that, uh, can I go to a football game without wearing a skirt and hose? Because <laughs> in those times, we, that's the way we went that. as the administration. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> I still have the gold jacket, so maybe in my next career I can work for Century 21. Don't lose it. <laughs> yeah. oh, how about um, outstanding event? Yeah, one of those. Well, uh, two outstanding events. One very positive, and the other one was kind of a sad day, but it it turned out to really show us the uh, I think the true Purdue and. Uh, the day that uh, we had the airplane crash and we lost a, a, an instructor and two students, um, September the 12th, I think, of 1997. Mm -hmm. Never forget the day uh, Professor Carney and I uh, was at the airport minutes after it happened, and we we stood there by the plane until the uh, you know the, all the details and investigations done. It's a very sad day. You never want to lose anybody. Uh, and yet, as a result of that, for a week, two weeks after that, uh, I think that uh, we went to the callings at the funerals. Uh, one of the young ladies from uh, Greenwood, Indiana, we went to the calling. I talked to the uh, funeral director, and he said he'd never had more people come. Uh, there were over 700 students that went from West Lafayette to Greens. Uh, Isn't that marvelous? To uh, pay their respects. Uh, same thing was true at all three. Uh, it it really showed me on a uh, sad time uh, the true Purdue family. Everybody Good. gathered around. We had the memorial services, but it, it drew students, faculty, everybody together. And uh, when the insurance company at Purdue settled with those three families, uh, all three of the families contacted us and gave us the money back for scholarships. And uh, that is a memory that I'll never forget. Right. That's very nice. And uh, Very rewarding. And they said, uh, you know, uh, the moms and the dads said they were doing exactly what they wanted to do. It was an accident. Don't change a thing in your program. Take this money and give somebody else the opportunity. And so it was a, it was a, very it, nice. it really, made it all worthwhile what we do around here, right. that we build that kind of uh, support. The other one was a very happy day. Um, uh, Professor Duncan was head of uh, aviation technology. We went out to visit uh, Boeing uh, and United Airlines uh, because United was going to build a maintenance facility in Indianapolis. And we were talking to them about how we could help them train people that they needed in that facility. And during the conversation, uh, one of their people said, we'd like to donate an airplane to Purdue, a 727. And we will paint it in Purdue colors and the whole uh, thing like that. And we'll deliver it uh, to you in Indianapolis because we want to have a celebration there because um, of opening that facility. And oh, by the way, Neil Armstrong is a member of our board of directors, and so uh, 
we'd like to have him involved. And so we came back and we started planning for this delivery of an airplane. <laughs> well, long story short, they, they flew the airplane to Indianapolis. We had a ceremony with the governor accepting on behalf of the state of Indiana, Dr. Bering and myself and several people in Purdue was there. Neil Armstrong came over from Ohio and they invited him and Dr. Bering and myself to join them on the flight to West Lafayette. We got on the plane, the test pilot that was flying the plane asked Neil Armstrong to fly the plane. And uh, he did. And after they took off in Indianapolis, it's about a 20 minute flight to West Lafayette. Uh, Neil was flying. He said he hadn't flown one in 25 years. Uh, <laughs> we flew over the Purdue Airport, uh, uh, kind of did a pass over the runway, uh, at full throttle. Uh, I said to the Vice President of the United, I think he's a little fast. He said, Neil can do whatever he wants to do. And uh, we went up to the west end of the airport and he pulled it up and like a fighter plane and we came around and he turned around and said to us uh, in the back, he said, uh, that was so much fun, we're going to do it again. And, uh, he, and we did that and then he finally landed the plane. Uh, the, the memory of that day was that uh, Neil Armstrong spent all afternoon talking to students, didn't want to talk to the news media, didn't want to, he wanted to talk to students. And these were all students that either weren't born or were babies at the time he walked on the moon. And yet they had such a high regard and, and wanted to meet this man. And he wanted to talk. And he spent all afternoon until the last student in line came through. That's true. And so a lot, a lot of those kinds of memories just... These are the really enriching things in your life. Right. That's, That's right. Just, exactly. Yeah. Now, in closing, we'll leave the uh, balls in your court. Any closing comments you'd like to say? Well, <clears throat> I think the the summary of my almost 50-year uh, relationship with Purdue is that uh, when people use the Purdue family and the loyalty to Purdue, you know, the staff, the faculty, the people that work here, uh, there is a there's a feeling that uh, they're loyal to this institution. Uh, you know, whether you're a professor or a dean or a service worker, everybody's extremely important. Everybody does their job. And, uh, and I also, I think that uh, being blessed with such a good family to support me, to let me do all this traveling, these kind of <laughs> things, uh, uh, wife and three kids and seven grandkids, and that's, that's my life outside of Purdue. My family. Yeah, tell us about your family. Where your son? You said your son's three boys. You have. <clears throat> I have uh, two boys and a daughter. Uh -huh. uh, all three are Purdue graduates. Uh, uh, our daughter uh, works at the Laporte County Hospital and teaches uh, computer classes at North Central Purdue. Um, she has two little boys, and her her husband's a Purdue graduate. He's a farmer in near Laporte. Our oldest son uh, works for Pfizer Pharmaceutical. Lives in Chicago. They have three children. Did he graduate from the pharmacy he, school he, here? Uh, well, he, he was a couple years in pharmacy, actually graduated in management because he wanted to go into pharmaceutical sales, and oh, okay. that's what he's primarily done. He's now uh, in charge of Pfizer's uh, salesman training program, works out of Schaumburg, Illinois. Our youngest son was Purdue Pete uh, in 89, 90, two years. Did he uh, enjoy it? He totally enjoyed it. it uh, the position was made for him. Uh, uh, he graduated in, in uh, liberal arts. Uh, he and his wife uh, run a software company out of their home in uh, Frisco, Colorado, up in the mountains. And uh, and so uh, they have two little, two two children. And so uh, the problem with our grandchildren is they're too far away. That's right. But, well, North uh, Central's not too bad. Not that <laughs> too far. That's a little close. That's yeah. a little closer. Uh, any uh, closing comments? Anything no, special? I think that's... Uh, we I, want I, to thank you very much. Well, Jennifer. I've enjoyed talking My to you pleasure. about it. My pleasure. I thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I have a little comment on the the gold jackets. I had forgotten about those, but... Yeah. What is it? Caldwell Banker, didn't they have the gold jacket?